So, about a week ago I decided to start this new single player world and a lot has happened since then. I initially didn't plan on making videos on it, but some people convinced me to do so anyway. Because of that I don't have that much footage of the early game, but I don't really think that's a big problem, since no one wants to see another person mine stone for 20 minutes. In this episode I'll mainly focus on what I've done after killing the Ender Dragon. The focus of this let's play will be to talk about how you tackle a technical world, what farms you should make and which decisions you make from a technical point of view. I will also try to tackle some common misconceptions I often see in more casual plays. In the later game I will try to design most farms myself, even if they're maybe not the most efficient possible. In this I'll also try to show you the design process and explain the mechanics going into the farm. With that said, let's get into it. First, we have to establish some rules. In my single player world, I won't be duping. No TNT duping, no sand or gravel duping, no concrete duping. There are two exceptions to this though. The first one is Dragon X, and the second one is Bedrock, but only in case someone ever discovers a way to get Bedrock in survival 1.16 or above. The no duping clause will also force me to dig perimeters by hand or use dispenser grids. On the topic of perimeters, I won't make any square perimeters. I personally find them boring and bland, I'd rather go for some more exciting shapes. I will also use some carpet rules. The first one will be Dragon Egg Battle Breaking, which implements the 1.12 Battle Breaking method in newer versions. I will also use shulkers respawning and cities and stackable shulker boxes. I use respawning shulkers because I don't want to dupe shulkers. I'd rather have some methods to farm them than to dupe them. I may or may not decide to enable or disable carpet rules in the future, but for now that's it. Finally, I also use lithium and phosphor to reduce server lag since my PC is a little bit of a potato. Then. My last rule is basically that I want to try to create every kind of farm myself at some point. Maybe in the beginning I will make someone else's design, but the plan is to always replace them with a better farm that hopefully I manage to design myself. Let's begin with the choice of the seat. I decided to choose this seat because it has a quad witch hood near spawn. And in mushroom biome very near spawn. I also chose this one over others because it has a lot of biomes very close by and because it has many big mesa biomes near spawn. I have some plans with those mesa biomes for the future. As you may or may not know, perimeters are a vital part of any technical world. This episode and following episodes will focus on the road of getting everything set up to start digging them. This will include getting lots of beacons and pickaxes, but also some other things. This here is my spawn, and as you can see, I have set up some basics, like an iron farm, a sugarcane farm, a villager breeder, and a very basic storage, and some crop farms. So, digging perimeters. Well, a very important perimeter in every technical world is a spawn perimeter. In 114 plus, the spawn chunks are 23 by 23 chunks in size. One makes a spawn perimeter to, to reduce the lag from it. This is because this 23 by 23 chunk area is loaded permanently. When a player is in the overworld, the middle 19 by 19 chunks will be loaded as entity ticking. In here, everything will be processed as normal. The border around this, the chunks 21 chunks out from the middle, will be loaded as non-entity ticking. In here, entities won't be processed, but redstone for example will still work. This is sometimes also called redstone processing. Finally, you have the last border at 23 chunks out. This is conveniently called border chunks. In these border chunks, almost nothing will be processed, though mobs for example will still count towards the mob cap. When there is no player in the overworld, the complete spawn chunks will be loaded as border chunks. So, the iron farm I've made will work since it's in spawn chunks, 
even if I'm not near it, as long as I'm in the overworld. Now, back on the topic of digging. Since I won't be digging any square perimeters, and the spawn chunks are square in size, I have to fit a different shape around them. I chose for a hexagon. The black outline will be the shape I'm going to dig. The red outline shows the actual spawn chunks. The volume I'll have to dig will be around 10 million blocks, though it's difficult to really calculate it because all the water there is. This is one of the three digging projects I have planned already. So, as I told you, I've already built an iron farm. I built Gnembom's design. It is decently fast yet simple. I made this farm on day 2 of my let's play. It was basically the first big project I did. Once I managed to get some basic tools and armor, I just located a village and snatched two villagers. I transported them on a minecart rail to, uh, uh, via the nether to my spawn chunks, and then I made a simple villager breeder. After that, I went to a pillager outpost and snatched one pillager. I put the pillager in a one by one hole with a too high wall, and then I replaced one of the top blocks with a top slab. That way, the pillager will be able to see you and try to shoot you, but the arrows won't be able to reach you. I AFK there for a while, until the pillager's bow broke. Then I could put the pillager on a railway. By the way, if you see the pillager in the minecart floating, that's due to a bug in replay mod. I don't know why it happens, but it looks quite odd, I think. From there on, everything else is quite trivial. If you use more basic materials like stone instead of glass and a small storage, you can probably make this on day one. The way this farm works is it has a pillager going around scaring the villagers. Each group of three villagers will spawn one iron golem, and they have beds to sleep to reset their timer. For more information, please do watch Knabu's video on it. Next, I started working on a general mob farm. Once Again, I used the design by Hinembo. This farm lets mobs spawn and then flushes them away into a hole for them to die. I used wither roses on top of soul sand to kill the mobs with armor. Because I used soul sand, the hoppers could pick up the items through the blocks. One thing I do want to touch on is the placement of the AFK spot. I often see people place the AFK spot in the place where it will decrease the spawn rate of the farm. I place it to the side. First of all, it is important to have the player at least 24 blocks away from the spawn pads. Mobs won't spawn closer to the player. It is also important not to place the AFK spot right above the farm, since the increased height will reduce the rate at which mobs will spawn. That's why the AFK spot is a little bit to the side of the farm. I also had to make sure that the 128 radiance spawn sphere wasn't too low. If it is too low, drones will be able to spawn in the water. Mobs are only able to spawn up to 128 blocks away from the player. So, I myself had removed some water in the size of a sphere at the bottom. This would be the despawn sphere. But not only had I placed the despawn sphere one block too high, which resulted in the wrong part of water being removed, it also wasn't really necessary. I learned that drones can only spawn below Y58. I thought they could spawn in, in every water level. So, all of the effort really wasn't necessary, though it still looks quite cool, so I'm happy with how it turned out. So, for getting XP, I built a small Enderman farm, and this farm is once again based on a design by Gnembo, his Ender Mini this time. By having a spawn platform at Y0, Enderman will spawn very quickly. I then lure them in to the hole with an Endermite, and then I can kill them with Sweeping Edge for as much XP as I want. The first really big project I'm working towards is a Nether Fortress farm. For all the digging projects and other general projects, beacons are very useful. Also, other drops from the Nether Fortress farm, like blaze rods and coal, will be very useful. I've already killed a few withers and managed to get a few beacons. I'll, I will use those to start digging out the perimeter for this farm. I'm not quite sure about shape yet. I might just go for a simple cylindrical perimeter or do a different shape. I have not yet decided about that one. The reason I chose this particular spot is because of the biome. 
it's partially in a basal delta and the resources I'll get from digging will come in very helpful. I'm actually very excited to start digging and maybe I'll decide on a shape that is a little bit more interesting than just a simple circle. Before I can start working on this project though, I need to work on two different projects. The first one will be making a small trading hall. This will allow me to trade for pickaxes, shovels, armor and many more things. To be able to efficiently trade, I need a lot of emeralds though. To get those emeralds, I will build a raid farm. So I don't have to trade with crops for hours on end just to get a few emeralds. After this is finished, I'll finally be able to do some proper, dig proper digging and get the proper tools for it. Other projects I want to do relatively soon includes a gold farm, a slime farm, a tree farm and basically any other simple farm you that could be useful in the early game. The last project I still have planned is a very important one. For any technical world you obviously need a lot of redstone. For fireworks you need a lot of gunpowder. This farm will help with that. I already told you that there was a quad witch hut in the seeds. Well, the first thing I'll be trying to make after the fortress farm is a quad witch farm. The concept of quad witch hut is pretty self-explanatory in my opinion. It's basically four witch huts close enough together that they fit in a single despawn sphere. Due to the way structure generation works, four is also the maximum amount of witch huts you can get in a single despawn sphere. Not every seed has a quad witch hut though, and that is why I specifically chose this seed so it would have a quad witch huts. Triple and dual witch huts, which is three and two witch huts in the despawn sphere, are a lot more common though and can be found in basically every world. Of course, I'll be digging the perimeter for this farm too. The shape I have decided on is a triangle. The size of this perimeter will be around 5.5 million blocks, which is a little more than just these parts here, which is between 3 and 3.5 million blocks. It will take a while until all of these perimeters are dug out, but I'm very excited to start work working on them. Luckily too, I'll be able to make a single witch hut farm way before the perimeter is completely dug out. I can just position my despawn sphere a little in the air so I can work with um, that already. So I can get some, at least some redstone and gunpowder before the uh, project is completely finished. And then I can do other projects while I grind on digging the complete perimeter out, which is quite nice, I think. So this is all I have done to this date. I have a lot of digging projects planned, but don't worry, I'll also be doing other projects for which I don't need perimeters, like for example tree farms, a slime farm, but also things like a mob switch, for example. I hope you enjoyed the episode and I think I have some very exciting things planned. I'll also try to do a little more first person stuff in the follow-up episodes, but it was a bit difficult to do that since I had to record every, every all the footage after I basically did it since I didn't plan on recording episodes on this. Since this was my first episode, any critique and advice would be greatly appreciated. Feel free to leave a comment with that or with any questions you have. Thanks for watching, leave a like and subscribe if you like the video and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye!